Does Jesus's resurrection prove that he is the Messiah? Do miracles really prove anything? Listen to how counter-missionary Rabbi Michael Skobek answers these questions. The Bible tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 13 that miracles don't prove anything because false prophets are able to do miracles. And in the Christian Bible, chapter 24 of Matthew, he says that false messiahs can do incredible supernatural miracles. So the fact that Jesus may have been resurrected would not prove he's the Messiah. Rabbi Skobak plainly states, the Bible tells us in Deuteronomy 13 that miracles don't prove anything. So if miracles don't prove anything, then of course Jesus' resurrection does not prove he's the Messiah. But is Rabbi Skobak right about the Bible's view of miracles? I think that God uses miracles to prove one's prophetic status, and in this video, I will focus specifically on Moses in the story of Passover as a strong example that this is the case. Thus, Passover supports this paradigm for understanding the significance of Jesus' resurrection. That is, miracles empowered by God validate true prophets. Let's begin with Exodus chapter 4. In this text, God provides Moses with three miraculous signs when he appears to Moses and speaks to him through the burning bush. We read in Exodus 4 verse 1 through 5. But Moses spoke up and said, What if they do not believe me and do not listen to me, but say, The Lord did not appear to you? The Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? And he replied, A rod. The Lord said, cast it on the ground. He cast it on the ground and it became a snake and Moses recoiled from it. Then the Lord said to Moses, put out your hand and grasp it by the tail. He put out his hand and seized it and it became a rod in his hand that they may believe the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob did appear to you. God tells Moses the reason he is providing Moses with the miraculous sign of turning his rod into a snake and then back into a rod is so our people may believe that the Lord appeared to him. Then God follows this up by encrusting Moses' hand with snowy scales and then restoring it. And God tells Moses that if Israel does not listen to him after providing that sign, that he should pour water from the Nile River on the ground and watch it turn into blood. These signs were intended to validate Moses as a prophet before Israel to convince our people enslaved in Egypt that Moses was truly sent by God. And as the great Torah scholar Nachmanides comments, God showed Moses wonders with the intent that he performed them before the people in order that they believe him. Nachmanides is right because in Exodus 4 verse 28 through 31 we read, Moses told Aaron about all the things that the Lord had committed to him and all the signs about which he had instructed him. Then Moses and Aaron went and assembled all the elders of the Israelites. Aaron repeated all the words that the Lord had spoken to Moses and he performed the signs in the sight of the people and the people were convinced. The reason the elders of Israel are convinced that Moses is a true prophet is because God validated him through miraculous signs. And these miracles were proof that Moses was a prophet and they compelled Israel to listen to him. In Exodus 14, Moses leads Israel to the Red Sea while the Egyptian army pursues them from behind. And God commands Moses to raise his staff so the children of Israel can cross through it on dry ground from their Egyptian oppressors. And we read in Exodus 14 verse 21 through 22. Moses held out his arm over the sea, and the Lord drove back the sea into dry ground. The waters were split, and the Israelites went into the sea on dry ground, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. So God splits the sea, enabling Israel to travel through it on dry ground. And after they all cross, the Egyptians attempt to cross as well. They're pursuing Israel. But God tells Moses to hold out his arm over the sea, and water comes down, destroying the Egyptian army. In Exodus 14, verse 31, the text reads, and when Israel saw the wondrous power which the Lord had wielded against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord, they had faith in the Lord and his servant Moses. The reason Israel has faith in Moses as a prophet is because they witnessed how God validated him 
through the miracles, parting the Red Sea, and destroying the Egyptian army. Exodus chapters 4 and 14 demonstrate that God validated Moses before Israel through miraculous signs. Do these texts contradict Deuteronomy 13, which according to Rabbi Skobak teaches that miracles don't prove anything? To find out, let's read Deuteronomy 13 verse 2 through 5, which says, If there appears among you a prophet or a dreamer diviner, and he gives you a sign or a portent, saying, Let us follow and worship another god, whom you have not experienced, even if the sign or portent that he named to you comes true, do not heed the words of that prophet or that dreamer diviner, for the Lord your God is testing you to see whether you really love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul. Follow none but the Lord your God, and revere none but him. Observe his commandments alone, and heed only his orders. Worship none but him, and hold fast to him. This passage provides the criteria for Israel to distinguish between true prophets and false prophets. If someone claiming to be a prophet produces a sign, but they tell Israel to follow and worship another god, or if they teach Israel to abandon the commandments, this teaching indicates that they are a false prophet despite their miracles. But this raises the question, how can Israel distinguish between true prophets and false prophets if they both produce miracles? To answer this question, we need to turn to the great Jewish philosopher Maimonides, the Rambam. In his letter to an oppressed Jewish community in Yemen in the 12th century CE, Maimonides says the following, we are enjoined to yield obedience to one who asserts that he is a prophet, provided he can substantiate his claims by miracle or proofs, although there is a possibility that he is an imposter. However, if the would-be prophet teaches tenets that negate the doctrines of Moses, then we must repudiate him. Maimonides further explains in Mishnah Torah, if a prophet seeks to discredit the teaching of Moses, we know for certain that he is a false prophet, and whatever he did was done by secret arts and with the aid of witchcraft. According to Maimonides, the key to knowing whether one is a true prophet or a false prophet is by judging whether the miracle they provide is actually from the power of God. And one way to know this is by evaluating the teaching of the one claiming to be a prophet. If they teach against Torah, we know that whatever sign they provided was empowered by something or someone other than God, and Maimonides cites witchcraft. However, if one claims to be a prophet and teaches Torah, then we know that the miracle they provided comes from God's power, and in response we are to obey them because God validates true prophets through miracles. I think Maimonides is right, and here's why. We already know from Exodus chapters 4 and 14 that God validated Moses through miracles to convince Israel that he was a prophet, and Maimonides' view of how to determine whether one is a true prophet is confirmed by Deuteronomy 18, verse 21 through 22, which says, You may say to yourself, how can we recognize a word that the Lord has not spoken? If a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, but the thing does not take place or prove true, it is a word that the Lord has not spoken. This text asks and answers the question of how do we know, how do we identify a false prophet? If they speak in God's name, but their promised sign does not take place, then we know that they are a false prophet. And this leads to the following observation. God would not fulfill the prophecy of a false prophet, and therefore would not validate the claim of a false prophet. What we learn from Deuteronomy 18 is that whatever miracle a false prophet performs to lead Israel astray does not come from God's power, because God would not validate the claims of a false prophet. In line with this kind of reasoning, Babylonian Talmud Sanhedrin 90a records Rabbi Akiva saying, Heaven forbid that the Holy One, blessed be He, would stop the sun for those who violate His will. A false prophet could never perform an actual miracle. Here's the point. God allows false prophets to perform miraculous signs, to lead Israel astray, to test their faithfulness to him, but that is not the same thing as empowering them to do so. I think the great 12th century Torah scholar Ibn Ezra puts it best when he says, It is a test 
in that God let him be and did not kill him. God tests people to reveal the virtue of him who is tested. God tests Israel's love and faithfulness to him by allowing the false prophet to perform miracles to lead Israel astray. God does not stop the false prophet. He holds back and does not kill them. And get this, Rabbi Michael Skoback agrees. We see in the Torah itself that even someone who is teaching us something that's not true and not right, they are able to effect incredible supernatural miracles. Now, the obvious question is, if they're a false prophet, why would God allow them the ability to do incredible miracles? It's an obvious question. And the Torah there in the 13th chapter of Deuteronomy gives you the answer. Because God might be testing us to see if we're going to follow the truth, which we've had established in the Torah, or will we be swayed by the magic tricks and the miracles of some false prophet. Rabbi Skobek is right. God tests us by allowing false prophets to perform miracles. And the key there is allowing, not empowering. God may allow a false prophet to perform miracles, but that is not the same thing as empowering them to do so. And again, as Nachmanides points out, the reason God empowers Moses with miracles was so that he would perform them before Israel in order that they would believe that he truly was a prophet. So to me, it makes the most sense that the false prophet uses miracles to lead Israel astray is because he or she is attempting to mimic what God uses to validate true prophets. And the story of Passover further confirms Maimonides' view. True prophets are not the only ones who are able to perform miracles, but when they do, those miracles are empowered by something or someone other than God. And we find this in the very first plague. When Moses and Aaron attempt to get Pharaoh to let Israel go, Aaron uses his rod to turn the water in the Nile River into blood. And notice what we find in Exodus 7 verse 22. But when the Egyptian magicians did the same, turning water into blood, with their spells, Pharaoh's heart stiffened and he did not heed them as the Lord had spoken. The Egyptian magicians used sorcery to mimic Moses and Aaron's miracle that was empowered by God. Babylonian Talmud Sanhedrin 67b recounts the teaching of Rabbi Hayabar Abba, who says, In this verse, Exodus 7 verse 22, And the Egyptians of Egypt did in that manner with their secret arts, Belatehem, these words are describing acts of employing demons, which are invisible, and their actions are therefore hidden. God is not empowering the Egyptians with miracles. They derive their signs from a source other than God. As Rashi says, our rabbi stated that Belatehem, secret arts, refers to the work of demons. Certain miracles, and in the context of Passover, plagues, can only be done by God. For example, one of the plagues that the Egyptian magicians could not replicate is producing lice. As the text says in Exodus 8, verse 13 through 15, Aaron held out his arm with the rod and struck the dust of the earth, and vermin came upon man and beast. All the dust of the earth turned to lice throughout the land of Egypt. The magicians did the like with their spells to produce lice, but they could not. The vermin remained upon man and beast, and the magician said to Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. The rabbis point out that the Egyptian magicians could not replicate this miracle through sorcery because demons are incapable of producing lice. Commenting on Exodus 8.15, it says in Babylonian Talmud Sanhedrin 67b, Rabbi Eleazar says, It is derived from here that a demon cannot create an entity smaller than the size of a barley grain. Consequently, the magicians were not capable of duplicating the plague of lice, and they realized that this was not an act of sorcery, but was performed by God. Even the Egyptians recognized that certain miracles can only be done by God, and one of the ultimate demonstrations of God's power over and against the Egyptians is when God destroys the Egyptian army in the Red Sea. After Israel crosses through the sea on dry ground, the Egyptians come after them. 
but they're unable to keep the sea parted because God alone controls the sea. As we read in Psalm 89, verse 9 through 10, O Lord, God of hosts, who is mighty like you, O Lord, your faithfulness surrounds you. You rule the swelling of the sea. When its waves surge, you still them. God alone rules the sea. And knowing this brings even more awe to the people's response in Exodus 14, 31. And when Israel saw the wondrous power which the Lord had wielded against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord. They had faith in the Lord and his servant Moses. Again, the reason the people of Israel have faith in Moses as a prophet is because they witnessed how God validated him through the miracle of parting the Red Sea and destroying the Egyptian army. The miracles done through God's power prove Moses' prophetic status. With all that, let's revisit Rabbi Michael Skoback's original point. The Bible tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 13 that miracles don't prove anything because false prophets are able to do miracles. Deuteronomy 13 actually assumes, it actually assumes that miracles do prove something. The reason a false prophet would use miracles to lead Israel astray is because God validates true prophets through miracles. False prophets attempt to mimic the real thing, and God allows them to do so in order to test Israel's faithfulness and love towards him. The principle that God validates true prophets through miracles is articulated with clarity by the following influential Jewish thinkers. Maimonides says, We are enjoined to yield obedience to one who asserts that he is a prophet, provided he can substantiate his claims by miracle or proofs. Rabbi Bachaya ben Asher writes, A person is not accepted as a genuine prophet before he has performed some miracle. And Rabbi Joseph Albo writes, The veracity of a prophet is proved either when he truly foretells the future in all particulars or when he performs miracles. If a prophecy is verified in this way, the Torah specifically commands us to obey the prophet. With this Jewish context, we can now turn to Matthew chapter 12. Up to this point in Matthew's Gospel, Matthew records Jesus performing very specific miracles that during the Second Temple period, some Jews expected would be done by the Messiah. In Matthew chapter 12, Jesus heals a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute. And in response, the crowds ask, can this be the son of David? Meaning, can this be the Messiah, this Davidic Messiah? They're asking the question, can Jesus be the Messiah, because they recognize that he could be the Messiah because of his miracles. The text continues in verse 24. But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, It is only by Beelzebul, the ruler of demons, that this fellow casts out the demons. These Pharisees are not questioning whether Jesus actually performed a healing miraculous sign. What they're doing is they're countering the crowd's curiosity that Jesus may be the Messiah by asserting that the source of Jesus' miracles are not from God, they're from Beelzebul, the ruler of demons. So God validates true prophets through miracles, but the miracles of false prophets come from other sources. And in this case, these Pharisees are attributing it to Beelzebul. Jesus then makes an argument for why his exorcisms, why his healings are done by God's power. But some of the Pharisees and scribes continue in verse 38, saying to Jesus, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. In context, they're asking Jesus for a sign to demonstrate that he is the Messiah. And Jesus responds, An evil and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so for three days and three nights the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth. Jesus is saying that the sign to prove his messianic identity will be comparable to Jonah's experience in the belly of the fish. He's going to die and shortly thereafter he will rise from the dead. And Jesus repeats this message to his disciples throughout the Gospels. Of all the miracles that Jesus could have appealed to, to demonstrate that he is the Messiah, he appeals to a miracle which in Judaism we know only God has the power to do. Only God can resurrect the dead. 1 Samuel 2 verse 2 and 6 makes this point well. There is no rock like our God. The Lord deals death and gives life, casts down a Sheol and raises up. 
The Jerusalem Talmud, Sanhedrin 10.2, explains the significance of 1 Samuel 2.6 clearly. Only the Holy One, praise to Him, can resurrect the dead. This teaching that only God has the power to raise the dead to life is clearly expressed in the Amidah prayer, which says, You are mighty forever, O Lord. You revive the dead. Who is like you, master of mighty deeds? Who can be compared to you, O King, who causes death and restores life and causes your salvation to sprout? You are faithful to restore the dead to life. Blessed are you, O Lord, who brings life to the dead. Today, the Amidah is the central prayer in the morning, afternoon, and evening prayers. And this section of the prayer, called the Givarot, praises God for God's might and his unique power to resurrect the dead. To sum up, one awesome truth we learn from Passover is that miracles empowered by God validate true prophets. Deuteronomy 13 confirms this. From this text, Maimonides rightly points out, that the way we know whether a miracle validates one claiming to be a prophet is by identifying whether the source of power for their miracle comes from God. God's exclusive power to resurrect the dead is what the Tanakh teaches and Judaism affirms to this day. The source of power for Jesus' sign to demonstrate his messianic identity, to prove that he is the Messiah, comes from God. And thus, Jesus' resurrection is God's validation of Jesus' messianic identity. When we understand Deuteronomy 13 in light of Passover and with the help of Maimonides, we see that contrary to what Rabbi Skobek says about it, Deuteronomy 13 is actually the foundation for why Jesus' resurrection would be evidence that he is the Messiah. Miracles empowered by God validate true prophets. And this is what Peter, an eyewitness to the risen Jesus and his miracles, says on Shavuot in the Jerusalem temple to his Torah faithful Jewish audience. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man clearly attested to you by God with powerful deeds, wonders, and miraculous signs that God performed among you through him just as you yourselves know. This Jesus God raised up, and we are all witnesses of it. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified both Lord and Messiah. If you learned something new, click the red subscribe button to receive notifications when we post new content. If you have any thoughts on anything I shared, please drop it in the comments below or send us an email at twomessianicjews at gmail.com. That's two T-W-O, messianicjews at gmail.com. Thanks for joining us and see you next time.